is a lie. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Sing it out, Jesus is a Good uh, morning and uh, welcome to Bishop Hankton Church. It's lovely to hear a hubbub. Um, if, if half term is applicable to you, happy uh, half term. Uh, my name's Ben and I'm the, the curate here at Bishop Hankton and it's lovely to see you all uh, on this wet autumnal day. Um, this morning we're delighted to welcome John McLernan with us. He's going to be preaching for us later. Uh, John is from Crosslinks and is uh, going to help us as we continue uh, as part of our, our World Mission uh, Awareness Month, just helping us to lift up our eyes uh, to see the great uh, mission uh, that the Lord has given us uh, to his world. But also I'm sure for many of us uh, this week is again that sort of, uh, as you turn on our te- television screens, we see kind of the the words of the news saying this is sort of unprecedented turmoil times, changing of prime ministers, of of politicians going up and down. Uh, And it's just good to remember the words that we thought of last Sunday uh, when we were all together, when Michael Prest uh, reminded us uh, from 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. Our, Our world may be uncertain, but Jesus is our sure foundation. Uh, and stronghold. So as we begin, uh, let me pray uh, for us uh, this morning. Father, we thank you that you you are our sure rock and foundation, that you are always dependable. Thank you that all the promises that you make are yes in Christ, uh, and we can be absolutely sure of those as we gather this morning. Uh, Whether we're young or old, help us to lift up our heads and our hearts to you today. Amen. With that in mind, let's stand and sing together, Lord, I lift your name on high. As you can see, I'm wearing a very light and bright jacket. That is because I'm getting ready for the light, bright family fun night. Oh, there is a lovely picture of it there. 
Um, the Lightbright Family Fun Night, it happens uh, every year, or it has done for the last few years, and the idea is to provide a bit of an alternative to Halloween. Because you probably know that for some people, the celebrations that they would have around this time of year can sometimes be a bit of a celebration of dark or scary things. Well, as Christians, we've got so many wonderful things to celebrate, haven't we? So it's a great excuse to have a party where we can celebrate light and bright things. And remember that Jesus is the light of the world. So the Light Bright Family Fun Night, it's light and bright, we're going to have lots of lights, and you can come and wear light bright things, uh, and it's going to be fun, uh, so there's going to be lots of fun things to do, it's a family fun night, so it's a great thing for families to come to, lots of things for children to enjoy, and lots of things for grown-ups with them to have fun with as well, and it's a night, it's at 5.30, and it goes on until 7 on uh, the 29th on Saturday. And uh, I thought it would be quite nice if I shared with you some of my highlights. Do you see what I did there? Highlights from previous Light Bright Family Fun Nights, just to get you in the mood. So what are some highlights that I can remember? I remember, um, like I said, every year it's, uh, it's a chance to dress up as well as other things. And I remember one year where a family came, and it wasn't a family who, who usually came to church here, and they were all dressed up in lovely bright things, and the dad especially, he was dressed up as a giant purple octopus. And it was amazing, and he definitely won a prize, because he was the most amazingly dressed grown-up. And that was really fun, so that was a highlight. I remember, oh, I know it was a, a big highlight, one year. In fact, it was last year. And everyone had all these bright colored post-it notes. And we made a great big picture that spelled out the word light with post-it notes. And on those post-it notes, people wrote, they were looking back and remembering the lockdown and all the difficult days that we'd had and how it was all quite dark and a bit sad. And they were thinking, what was the light in the darkness for me during that time? And they wrote them on their bright colored post-it notes and stuck them on the picture. And that was really lovely to see. Lots of different suggestions from people from our community. People wrote about how uh, about having a baby was a highlight or about how they were able to, to meet up with people on Zoom and that was a highlight. And there was one, there was a, a, a little girl and she was someone, she, 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 um, her mum and dad didn't come to church here but she still come along, came along sometimes with somebody else. Uh, and she wrote on her post-it note, I love Jesus. Wasn't that a lovely thing? That was the light in the darkness for her uh, over those dark times. Um, oh, yeah, last year. Uh, no, was it last year or the year before? I can't remember. But at some point, it was quite fun, a little highlight that the people who, who won prizes, they won uh, a bright colored crown like this so that they could be all light and bright as they went back outside after the party. And then the other highlight, which I think counts as a tradition now because we've done it more than twice, and that was the pumpkin bowling. Some of you have done that before, where we get some pumpkins and we use them as bowling balls and we roll them along the ground. I'm not going to, Ben was looking worried for a minute there. And, uh, and knock down some pins uh, and have a really fun game of pumpkin bowling. And they usually end up a little bit battered from the pumpkin bowling, but it's worth it because it's a really fun game. So, if you fancy doing any of those things, you can come along. Three things to, to remember. The Light Bright Family Fun Night is a really good thing to come to. It's a really good thing to invite friends to. And it's a really good thing to help at. So, if you fancy doing any of those three things, uh, come along on the 29th or have a word with me if you want more details. Excellent. I hope Ben. Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine. So, that's... Uh, Saturday, this coming Saturday, at 5.30 uh, to 7. Uh, it's now time for our, our children to head out to their groups. Uh, let me just explain uh, how that's going to happen. Uh, Rooted, that's our, our teenagers group, our 11 to 14s, they're heading out down uh, into the blustery conditions uh, to head out down the road to, to the yak. Hope you've got a coat. Um, <laughs> Uh, if you're sort of from three to 11, um, so that's sort of three-year-olds up to year six, uh, heading out to, into the lounge, go out through uh, the doors on your back left over there uh, into the lounge next door. Uh, if you're under three, uh, sort of about 18 months of three, then we've got a, a group happening through these doors on the front left 
uh, round the corner. And if you're very little, you're very welcome to, to stay uh, in the service. Uh, but likewise, the service is also being shown in the small room round the corner there, in the Latimer room, uh, where you can watch it uh, on the screens. But we're very welcome to stay uh, in the service. Our children will be returning back to us uh, later on uh, for communion. Uh, but before they go, let me quickly pray. Father, thank you so much for our children. Thank you that they're part of our church family. Uh, And Lord, we pray for them and their leaders. They'd have not simply lots of fun, but also chances to know more about you, our great God. Amen. Uh, As they go, let us stand and sing. Bless the Lord. Take your seats. Um, just uh, a quick few bits of Bishop Harrington Church uh, family news. Everything that you'll need uh, will be on the, the BH News emails if you get those. If you don't get those uh, but you'd like to, please get in touch with the office. Um, also, there's a, a number of little announcements in these uh, sheets to draw your attention to, so please do uh, grab those. But just a few to uh, mention. Uh, at the back, 
Uh, you may remember that we've been uh, collecting a, a thank you gift for, for Wendy Whiffin, uh, which is in the office. There's a little card at the back. Wendy, you can sign your cards uh, if you want to. Uh, but if you want to sign uh, Wendy's card, please do uh, just at some point at the end of the service, uh, just write a little note uh, in the card that's at the back of church uh, to do that. Uh, secondly, uh, in two uh, Sundays' time, so that's the 6th of November, uh, we have a bereavement service happening uh, here in church at 3 o'clock. Uh, during that service, uh, we, list, uh, we read out a list of names of people uh, who, who are loved ones who we want to remember. Uh, if there is somebody you'd like us to read their name out of, please just uh, grab me at the end of the service and have a word, or, or check if, if we might have a name already. But please do uh, just grab me uh, and let me know uh, if you'd like us to read that name out uh, of the service. That's three o'clock, and then followed uh, by refreshments uh, afterwards. Uh, tickets are, are still plenty available for the Panto. Oh, yes, they are. Um, <laughs> Oh, thank you, Sam. Thank you. Uh, the 2nd of December, uh, Panto uh, Neverland, a fantastic opportunity uh, to, to invite friends just to come into the church, a very gentle uh, way in to begin uh, Christmas festivities. The 2nd of December, Friday uh, the 2nd, uh, sign up uh, on the website. Uh, £12 for adults, £6 for children, uh, capped at uh, £36 uh, for families. Uh, it was a wonderful time last year. Uh, I'm sure it will be a great time uh, again. And then, as we've mentioned already, this is our, our Mission Awareness Month. Uh, next Sunday uh, morning, after the morning service, uh, we have a, a special time to pray uh, for the Salvianos and the Russells. Uh, you may remember we were doing some on the Wednesday evenings. We'll be doing that after the morning service next Sunday. Uh, come and join us. Uh, but this Sunday, uh, we've got a, a very own Grilla Mission Director little slot. Uh, it's a chance to come and ask John uh, all those questions that you want to uh, ask about mission. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure there's no question that you don't want to, There you go. He's saying any question uh, is welcome. Uh, but with that in mind, John, do you want to come and uh, let's get to know you a little bit better so we know who we're grilling uh, later. Uh, John, do you just want to introduce yourself? Yeah, m my name is John McLernan. Uh, I'm the, the mission director for Crosslinks. And I, I, I live in Crowborough. So we're not a million miles away from here. I travelled down this morning uh, where I live with Maggie, my wife, and our two girls, Ruthie and Rachel, who are 17 and 14 years old. Fantastic. Now, now uh, earlier before the service, we were having a little, little chat, and I discovered that you used to work in IT. In fact, you told me that you created that little postcode address finder thing that was happening, and it was yes. marvellous technology. But, but how did you go from IT to mission director? I guess it goes back a long time, but, but, most, but I think probably about 20 odd years ago, uh, my wife and I were sitting in a service not unlike this. It wasn't a particularly mission-focused Sunday, and I think we came to about three or four in the afternoon. My wife looked at each other and said, so what did you think about the talk this morning, the sermon this morning? And we both came to the realization that we were feeling challenged by the Lord, that we ought to be doing something different with our lives. Now, I really enjoyed the job I had in IT. I, I personally didn't invent that thing. I worked for the company that, that, that invented that kind of postcode to address lookup thing that everybody uses now. Um, and I wasn't quite sure what that was. Um, so I, I talked with our pastor and I went in the old course here and there thinking it might be church ministry. Um, but wasn't, that wasn't the direction that led us. And let's just say it, being open to what the Lord might lead us to, I find myself a year later um, interviewing with the board of another missionary society to take on the role of, of UK director for that organization, People International, uh, working in Central Asia for the best part of uh, seven, uh, 13 years before moving to be the mission director at Crosslinks, uh, what, just four years ago now. So really just open to the Lord. And uh, I mean, so many years, many, many years before that, I wondered what the Lord might be leading us to. So it wasn't out of the blue, but just being open to his leading at the right time, mm. I think. Brilliant. And it, it was, it was a, and you said it was about a year or so. Just It wasn't kind of an yeah. overnight snap decision, just actually the gentle... It, it was a year of discernment mm. and, and praying and just, and just the, the opportunity came and we gently pushed it. Still quite happy. I was quite happy with my job. I loved it. Um, but saying, Lord, if this is what you're leading us to, I, I'm, I'm willing to explore this. And, and we uh, sensed this was the right thing to do before the Lord. Fantastic. And then you mentioned now you're, you're working with Crosslinks, and, mm. and Crosslinks have just celebrated a centenary anniversary, is that right? That's right. Well, we've, we've had a couple of weeks of celebrations. Actually, the centenary is this 
uh, Thursday at three o'clock oh. <laughs> is the exact moment when BCMS, the Bible Churchmen's Missionary Society, come in uh, to existence. Uh, I mean, uh, and we've, in some respects, it was quite a sad beginning. It was, it was born out of um, some in the church a hundred years ago uh, questioning uh, the authority of the Word of God, not convinced that the utter- utterances of Jesus were accurate and authoritative, um, and a, a number of the, uh, a number of missionaries were being sent out across the world who didn't believe in the authority of the Bible or that what Jesus said was true. Uh, and there, it, there was people contended at the time, I remember reading, so I wasn't there, um, of reading of a committee meeting in April of uh, 1922 that 500 people, clergy and lay, came along to to contend and say, this isn't right. Three months later, a thousand people came to this committee meeting in London to say, this, this isn't right, we can't keep doing this. And this was, the, this was the, the direction of the Church of England at that time, not just missions. And it was re- became clear that there was, no, there was no changing the mind of people. So as a response to that, the Bible Church and Missionary Society was born um, with, with the priorities of proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing that as authoritative uh, and training and equipping men and women who will proclaim the, the gospel. So that's, that's mm. our beginnings, really, and that's what we've been striving to do for the last hundred years. And, and so as a, a, a mission director of a, a mission organization, you, you get quite a breadth, I guess, of, of what they're, what's happening, both in, uh, I suppose, primarily in Crosslinks uh, and also looking back over time. Mm. So just what is it that excites you at the moment about world mission? I think what excites me... I mean, we, I, I, I'm enormously privileged that I see and hear things. I mean, all the prayer letters, the news from our missionaries, as well as other organizations. But actually going out and meeting people, as, as an organization, we give bursaries at this point in time to about 65 people, mostly in the developing world. Often people who are already in ministry, they might be ministers of churches, but with no theological education, or those wanting to go that direction. Um, so actually meeting some of those people, I, I was in Kenya a few months ago, meeting some of our study partners, our bursary holders, and just seeing the difference in their lives that that makes, or, or visiting um, churches that we have either established in Europe, um, or supporting in other parts of the world, and just seeing the difference in people's lives, how they are moving on with the Lord, uh, or actually coming to hear about the Lord Jesus for the first time because of this. I think that's the thing that excites me. Now, in my role of mission director, there's all sorts of things I have to get involved with, all of the things that, you know, routine things, and, but actually that's the thing that gives me energy, just seeing the Lord changing people's lives through his word and it being taught faithfully week by week. Oh, thank you. So, so how can we be praying uh, for you and for, for Crosslinks at the moment? Uh, let, let's, one, one thing uh, coming up uh, next week, I think it is, week after, it is very particularly we have the next election meeting twice a year. We sit down and I think we've probably got 30 or 40 applications for bursaries. Um, and it's heartbreaking as we look through a long list of people applying for bursaries across a lot of them from Africa this time, I think. Uh, and we only have so much money we can spend on that. Now, we, we spend £100,000 a year on bursaries. Um, and, but this next tranche, that's always heartbreaking. So we need wisdom as a leadership team to work that through, I think. Um, for me personally, um, I, I think I'm challenged about uh, how Crosslinks uses money. Okay, there's a... Uh, mission societies are divided on this. You know, should, should we support projects, over, local indigenous projects overseas or not? Um, money can be helpful, but it can also be damaging in, in all sorts of ways. And so I'm trying to work through how we as Crosslinks might best support churches, projects, colleges that we do financially, or, or sorry, churches do, and it gets channeled through us, in a way that most helps them and enables them in their ministry and doesn't create some of the difficulties that that can present. Now, if you want to know more about what that means, you can ask me that later, mm-hmm. okay? What are the challenges of using money overseas, international money? Because it, it can be a hindrance. Um, but I think as I work that through before God, in front of Crosslinks, and what we might be doing going forward, that's my, my, ch- my challenge at the minute, I think. Great. Can we pray for you and pray for Crosslinks? Yeah, thank you. Father, we thank you so much for bringing uh, John here with us this morning. Uh, we thank you for uh, the way you worked in his life uh, and uh, Maggie's wife to, to bring them uh, to this place now. 
Um, And Lord, we pray that that day by day he uh, and the whole family may know your hand with them, knowing more of your goodness and kindness to them, uh, especially as they work uh, seeking to make Christ known across the world. Uh, And we pray for John's work with Crosslinks. We pray that particularly just for those challenges of of knowing where to use resources, where to use uh, money. Uh, really, no, it's not an easy thing, and money can be a, a great door opener, but also, as he's just shared, could also be challenging too. Um, and so far, we pray for real wisdom for, the, uh, for Crosslinks and John in particular, and also just very particularly for this meeting about bursaries. Lord, we know it can almost make, be impossible to make decisions, uh, to know who to support and who not to. Uh, but Lord, we just pray in your providence that uh, you'd be leading, leading all those uh, involved. Uh, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're thrilled to have John. He's a great wealth of experience, so please do come along uh, later. Let's give him a round of applause, though. Show our appreciation for coming. Thank you, John. We're looking forward to, to grilling you later. I'll start making a few notes to think of some awkward questions. Um, uh, now uh, we're going to continue uh, in prayer as Alison is going to come to lead us. And afterwards, uh, we're going to have our Bible reading, which is going to be done uh, on the TV screens as Susanna Baldwin, our, our mission partner uh, in Australia, working with Wycliffe uh, Bible Translators, will, will read us uh, our Bible reading. And then afterwards, John will come uh, and preach. Alison. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day that you've given us, for the earth, for the sun that rises and sets, for the rain, for the seasons that help things grow. Thank you for the order in the world that you made. Thank you for all those who have helped us to get to the place that we're at today. Thank you for those who first told us about you, for those who have helped our knowledge of and love for you to grow. We pray that you will guide and inspire the leaders of our church. Thank you for those that you have given to us in our lives, in our community, and in our church to love and care for, and for those who love and care for us. We pray for our world in which there are so many needs. Particularly, we pray for the situations in Ukraine, Russia, Iran, and China, and for the people in those countries. We pray that you would help them to reach out to you in their distress. We pray for our King and his family as they continue to grieve for the late Queen. We thank you for the King's professed faith, and we pray that you will help him to grow in faith and wisdom, and that you will give him clarity about his role in the midst of the current political turmoil. We pray for our government that you would enable the right person to be chosen to lead our country that you will give them great wisdom, empathy, and kindness as they deal with the many priorities, both at home and abroad. We pray for those within our community who are suffering hardship, whether through sickness, bereavement, or financial difficulties. We'll take a moment now to pray privately for any people that we know of personally. Dear Lord, please be with these people and with all those who are trying to help them. We pray for James and Carolyn Webb working in Zaya in Spain, in the Basque country. We pray that they will work well as a team with the Aldana family, um, serving you effectively in unity. Please bless their families and help them to get their strength in you. We pray for all those families and individuals working away from their home communities with cross links, thinking especially of the Milson family in Spain. Please help them to be great witnesses to the community in which they are working. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. Hi, I'm Susanna. I serve with Wycliffe Bible Translators in the Northern Territory of Australia, and it's my privilege to read the Bible passage for you today. The passage is Genesis 22, verses 1 to 19. I'm reading from the NIV 2011, and in the BH Church Bibles, you can find that on page 22. So 
Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father? Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, The Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, On the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. Then Abraham returned to his servants and they set off together for Beersheba and Abraham stayed in Beersheba. Please do keep that passage open in front of you on page 22 on the church Bibles. Um, Let's pray together. Lord our God, we come to your word again this morning, reading this account of something that happened so many, very many years ago. Please speak to our hearts and our minds. Help us to leave here changed as a result of meeting with you, the living Lord, in his word. Amen. Amen. I remember, probably more than 20 years ago, trying to sell the house that I lived in, in Hackney. We, we, we were selling up to move to Leafy Kent, uh, and the, the first stages were going really very well. But then we started to hit the buffers. Now, it should have been very straightforward. Um, there was no chain in front of us. There were cash buyers behind us. But the whole process just started to stall. Now, I've got to be careful here. This might be raising emotions in some of you this morning, if you've been through that yourself. Um, But I got to the point where the solicitor would say, oh yeah, next week, and then next week. Uh, And eventually I got to the point and said, look, stop. Tell me why you are confident that this next thing will happen next week. What is the basis of your confidence right now? And then there was that awkward silence. And, and, And he admit it as much and I realized that his words were just to keep me placated they were warm words based on guesswork and past experience our solicitor had just wanted me to trust his words but in an instance what dawned on me was that my trust or what had now become my lack of trust in the person making the promises to me was evident and actually I had now, not only were his words meaningless, but actually I realized I didn't trust the person who was making these promises to me. 
And as we come to our passage this morning, we see Abraham being put to the test by God. Abraham demonstrating that, that trusting in the God who made a promise to him was perhaps more important than the promise itself. And that that trust he displayed was based on faith that was born out in obedience. Not quite trust equals faith plus obedience, but, but more trust equals faith enacted, faith de- de- demonstrated, faith confirmed by obedience. And so we, we come to our, our, our first bit of this passage this morning, the test. Genesis 22, verse 1. Let's read from verse 1 onward. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, he said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. Wow. Can any of us begin to imagine what was going through Abraham's head right now? How he had longed for a son, not only for a son for himself, but or, or to put an end to Sarah's disgrace, but later on, the son who would become the one, the fulfillment of God's promise to him when he was told that he, Abraham, would become a great nation. And God said these words that must have felt like six daggers to his heart. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Let's give him a name, Isaac. Sacrifice him as a burnt offering. That, that almost seems horrific, doesn't it? And, and, and let's, let's be clear, in case we're tempted to think that Abraham had this sort in his head, if, if this was a, an easy thing for Abraham to do, um, we wouldn't be reading this account this morning. It wouldn't be recorded here in this agonizing detail in Genesis 22. As an onlooker uh, this morning, we might be forgiven for asking the question, what kind of God is this? Why would God do something like this? But here it is, it is in front of us, and and it may be uncomfortable, but we need to work out what we are to to learn from this test. From verse three onward, we'll see how Abraham responded to the test, but what is at the heart of this test? Will Abraham trust God? That's the test. Will Abraham trust God? Will he trust God to fulfill the promise to him despite what the situation suddenly looks like? Will he bottle it as, when he, as he passed Sarah off as his sister? Will he uh, take, 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 take things into his own hands like when Sarah suggested that he take one of her uh, maidservants to, to father a child because it wasn't happening? Or perhaps will his feelings for this most beloved son get in the way of God's purposes? Will he trust God and follow his plan when it seems to to run counter to any any understanding of what Abraham thought ought to happen. Now, I can't imagine that any of us here, or a few of any, but any of us have had to make the kind of decision that Abraham faced this morning in our passage. But the question hanging in front of Abraham is still there perhaps to be answered in a different way for each of us. What in my life is unnegotiable before God? What is it that stops me letting God be Lord of every part of my life? Now, I I, I don't know any of you personally, and it's always a danger when someone, when a visiting preacher comes um, to a congregation to ask questions like this. And the risk is that what I'm about to do just starts to induce guilt in all of you. And that's not my, my aim this morning. It's not to beat you up spiritually, trust me. But the question that each of us from time to time should ask ourselves is this. In this situation, if this, was, if this was me, what would be the test that God would put in front of me? What is potentially unnegotiable before God? Children? Family? Money? A particular relationship, perhaps? Our career? Our identity? 
perhaps just stuff, things that we own, our, our property, our home that we live in? What, what have I left off the list? None of these things are intrinsically bad in themselves. They're all good things. But which of those things are unnegotiable before God and his plans in our lives? That's perhaps the question that we might ask ourselves. I want to move on quickly from that. Because if if we see the, the test, the test was actually God saying to Abraham, what will you put before me? Will you trust me in this situation? Let's move on to the response. How did Abraham respond to the test that God had set for him? Well, he responded by faith and obedience. He responded by faith and obedience. Verse three, early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. There was no hanging about with Abraham. There was no talking over with anyone. We don't know if he talked it through with Sarah, what a conversation that would have been. The impression we get is that he acted decisively, instantly, without delay. And and this, this man of great stature, of great wealth, not to mention of great age, he was 100 years old, he took complete responsibility. He cut the wood himself He he loaded his donkey and he set off with his son Isaac and two of his servants. And verse four, we see on the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. For three days, he journeyed. For three days, undoubtedly, he worked through in his mind the Lord's words to him over and over again. Take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac sacrifice him as a burnt offering and then they were there or at least they were within striking distance of it verse 5 he said to his servants stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there we will worship and then we will come back to you notice he says we will worship and then we will come back to you I mean, what did he mean by this I'm not sure we can entirely be sure is this an expectation by Abraham that the Lord is about to do something miraculous he's about to sacrifice his only son and somehow the Lord might bring him back to life again we we, we don't really know but verse 6 he kept going Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac and he carried and he himself carried the fire and the knife and the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Finally, Isaac speaks up, They have traveled for three days. They have wood, they have fire, they have a knife. But where is the animal that is to be sacrificed? Now, I know as a parent, there are times when I've not wanted to say, to answer a question from from one of my girls. Often it's, it's because I've not wanted to say yes, but I've also not wanted to say no at the same time. Often there's a bigger picture that they don't perceive. You know, Daddy, can we have an ice cream, please? Which, which, with, to which I didn't want to answer yes or no. Yes, we would have an ice cream that day, but what they didn't realize was, as a surprise, we might be going to an ice cream parlor later, and there's an even bigger ice cream they were going to get than the cone that they maybe wanted from the ice cream van at the beach. And so my response, we'll see. That's a great catch-all response, isn't it? I don't know how many of you parents have used that over the years. We'll see. Actually, many years later, my eldest called me out and I said, Daddy, that means no, doesn't it? Um, it, but, But we'll see. But Abraham's response to Isaac wasn't we'll see or the equivalent of it. Without Isaac knowing the full picture, his father's statement to him was both a statement of fact, of absolute truth, God had provided the sacrifice. It was Isaac. And at the same time, 
It was a statement of faith. He didn't know exactly how, but Abraham knew that God's plans were going to work out. He knew it had to work out. He was still trusting in God. Maybe that was part of the faith that led him to say, we will worship God and then we will come back to you. However, the time had come for that faith to be borne out in a final act of obedience. The physical journey had finished, but the mental and emotional journey of the past three days still had some distance to go. Verse 9 When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. We really don't know very much about Isaac at this point, apart from him being described as a boy or a youth. But we do know that he was old enough, certainly strong enough to carry sufficient wood but on this final part of the journey that was intended to consume his whole dead body. And so that if he was strong enough to do that, we can only assume that he was strong enough to resist a 100-year-old man who was intent on binding him up and on killing him. In fact, when we read on into Genesis, we don't really get to know very much about Isaac and his character and his personality. He's certainly not perfect, certainly when he repeats one of his his father's tricks of passing his wife off as his sister. But among the patriarchs, is there another like Isaac who appeared to display obedience like this, who was willing to sacrifice himself out of obedience to his father, out of obedience to his God? Verse 10 Then he reached out his hand, Abraham this is, and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. The moment had come and Abraham did not fail the test. Nothing in Abraham's life was unnegotiable. Abraham's life actually was one big test after another, but this one final test, this one ultimate test, was the one that Abraham passed. Abraham feared God and placed him above all else. Now, I said earlier that not many of us will face a test like Abraham but we will face tests in our lives, things that will cause us anxiety. A silly example, just, I recalled yesterday morning, that felt really enormous at the time. I was in the youth fellowship of my church in, in Coleraine in the north of Ireland, and our church, um, the, the gates opened on to the, the marketplace, the diamond it was called. And we as a youth, long story, but we as a youth fellowship decided we wanted to go out and do an outreach event on a Saturday to anybody who happened to be there, a group of 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds. And we decided we were gonna do some street outreach. Uh, And we prayed for some time, we prepared ourselves. Um, And as we went into the church to pray before going out, rather nervously, we, we saw these two guys, two buskers playing the accordion just about 10 meters from the gates of the church. And we were devastated. We're thinking, Lord, what's going on? We, you know, this was enormous in our lives. We wanted to do this. And we could have been reaching to the, reaching to the Psalms and raining down brimstone on these guys, you know, thinking, Lord, what's going on? Who are these people who are anti the gospel, who are you know, going to take people away from us? You know, as you can imagine, it wasn't a big thing looking back, but in our minds it was a thing. And, but we didn't. We decided to pray in faith, Lord, you know, your will be done in this situation. We mean no ill to these people. You know, please, will you make it work in the end? And I remember as we we went out confidently, fearfully, um, and we set ourselves up, and we're just about to start. I think somebody started strumming a guitar as we're about to sing. And these two buskers, with a crowd of about 30 or 40 people who are watching them, just walked slowly across to us and brought their crowd with them. It was a group of buskers from Bangor County Down who were just having some fun, Christians, and who saw what we were about to do and brought the crowd to us. 
whom we preached to and sang to and did all sorts of things like that. A silly thing, but... And, and these things are often routine, aren't they? The, the things that cause us anxiety are, are routine. Not always nice, being slandered perhaps, being misrepresented, being hurt because we've been not chosen for that team, because we've not been chosen for that event. We've been left off the, the party list for that party from our friends that we wanted to go to. A planning application from the house next door that I really don't like the look of. How will we respond to those tests? Will it be to fight back in underhand ways? Will it be devious to manipulate the truth, to harbor anger in our hearts? Or will it be to apply the teaching of the Bible in loving, godly, in truthful ways, in ways that will lead us away from sinning, that will keep us close to the will that we already know. We don't need a special revelation from God in those situations how to deal. He tells us how we ought to live our lives, that we will live lives that avoid sinning. Verse 13, Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. And so Isaac survived. The promise was secure. And the much waited for boy was the offspring through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. But the promise was not ultimately fulfilled in Isaac. Rather, it was fulfilled in another who would come many years later, wasn't it? Descended from Isaac. We started off with the test and then the response. But thirdly, there's the bigger, pla bigger plan hidden in plain sight in this passage. Now, I, I don't know if, if, like me, you're visiting Bishop Hannington this, this morning, or perhaps you, you're, visit, you're here and you're relatively new to the Bible and Christian things. But although we've been reading about Abraham's faith and obedience in this passage, there is something much, much bigger that I'm sure many of you will have spotted this morning. A bit like re-watching an Agatha Christie detective drama and spotting the things that you missed first time around that were ultimately important to solving the case. Because in this account of Abraham and of Isaac, we see enacted the first glimpse, the first forward echo of something much, much bigger that would change everything for all time. I wonder if you spotted them with me. The father offering his son, his son, his son whom he loved as a sacrifice. The son willingly offering himself as a sacrifice. The son carrying the wood that he would be sacrificed on. From the moment that God spoke to Abraham, Isaac was ready in Abraham's mind dead. Yet in three days later, his son returned back to him metaphorically alive. There's some debate, but it's thought that Mount Moriah is pretty near modern day Golgotha, outside Jerusalem. So not only did God make a promise to Abraham, but he enacted in his life the means by which the ultimate meaning of the promise that he made to him would be fulfilled generations later. And so we go to the gospel accounts and we see God the Father send his only beloved son, the Lord Jesus, to be sacrificed on a wooden cross. The cross that he carried to his own place of execution. The son that went willingly out to death, willingly out of faith and obedience to his father the son who died on a hill outside Jerusalem and who came back to life three days later. But there is, of course, a difference, something of a difference. In Jesus' case, there was no ram to die instead of him like there was for Isaac. Instead of a substitute dying in Jesus' place, he became our substitute. Later on in the Old Testament, in Moses' time, God institutes the animal sacrifice to deal with Israel's sin, a sacrifice that was made every year. But Jesus became the last and final sacrifice once and for all to take the punishment for all people. It was him who became a substitute for the penalty that each of us deserve for our sin, for our rejection of God himself. 
And right here in the story of Abraham, we see God's bigger picture, God's plan to restore the broken relationship between him and the people whom he created. And so how did God respond to Abraham's faith and obedience? A promise confirmed. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. The angel of the Lord called a second time. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you've done this and not withheld your son, your only son. This is not a restatement of the promise that God made to to Abraham in Genesis 12. This is much more emphatic than that. I swear by myself, declares the Lord. The promise is not just restated, it is confirmed. The promise that was made many years ago, um, when, when Abraham had done nothing to please God, It was purely God speaking out to Abraham at that point. This promise was now sealed by the devotion and obedience shown by Abraham. In fact, James, many years, describes it like this in James uh, James 2, verse 21 onwards. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions working together and his faith... Um, was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. And so as we draw to a close, what is it that God wants of us, brothers and sisters, this morning? What is it that God wants of us? From those of us who are already followers of the Lord Jesus, if if we are truly to experience the blessing of God in our lives, we need to continue to learn what it means to trust the Lord. Not least when the circumstances cause us to question why the Lord is permitting what is happening in front of us, whether whatever is confusing or testing or whatever hurtful thing is happening in front of us that causes us to doubt him. To demonstrate, he's calling us to demonstrate our faith and his plans for us by obedience to his will from what we already know revealed in his Bible. And as we look to those promises from the Bible, we take comfort, but ask ourselves, do we actually have confidence in the God who makes those promises? Is that where our trust is? Not the words of the promises, but the God who makes them to us. And to those of us this morning who are not yet trusting in the Lord Jesus, what is it that is stopping us recognize God, recognizing God for who he is? What is it that we don't want to give up? What is unnegotiable in our lives? This passage this morning points us to a blessing for you too. From the very beginning of time, we see that God has a plan to deal with the problem of our sins. The very thing that separates us from almighty God, our righteous God, Jesus himself said the words, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. The blessing of eternal life is promised to those who trust that God died on that cross, paying once and for all for the sins that we deserved to have paid, uh, that we deserve to pay. Accepting that by faith alone, that by understanding there's nothing we can do to earn favor with God, and then confirming that faith through obedience, by repenting, by submitting to his lordship, by making him lord of our life. By doing that, the most fantastic promise is fulfilled in us by the most trustworthy promiser of all. Let's pray. (coughs) 
Father God, please help us in our daily life, our daily walk with you to learn what it means to trust you more and more, what it means to exercise faith and confirm that by our obedience in doing what is right before you that we know revealed in your word. Lord, thank you ultimately for the promises and the, this beginning of the telling of the story of Jesus right from Genesis 22 that you had a plan uh, that you alone are the one we trust in and we could see you fulfilling through all the scripture that the Lord Jesus would come that you provided the sacrifice once and for all paid for our sinfulness that we may be made right before you that that promise you made may be confirmed in our lives that you have sealed us with the Holy Spirit and that you call us yours and you keep us for eternity. Help us, Lord, to make this real in our lives, to remember it day by day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, John. Um, in a moment, we're going to stand and sing about the servant king, the one, the son who came to, to give his life as a ransom for many, uh, to come to, to give his life, to serve us so that we might be uh, forgiven. And as we sing, um, if you've got children uh, next door in the lounge or in the Cramner room, if you'd like to go and, and collect them, uh, and then we can bring them back uh, so we can all share in the Lord's uh, Supper. Um, just to say, though, if you don't quite get back in time by the end of the song, don't worry. Um, we don't mind noise. Uh, it doesn't matter. We're a family. Uh, and likewise, during the, the words of communion, actually, if you want to talk to your children, uh, please do. Explain what's going on. Uh, use it as an opportunity uh, to help them understand more uh, about what we're remembering uh, and what uh, we're doing. So please, don't worry. Uh, we're just very grateful uh, that you're here. But as the song starts, if you could go next door uh, and pick them up, that would be uh, much appreciated. Uh, but now let's stand uh, and sing From Heaven You Came.
remain standing. Um, it's lovely to see our children returning again. Oh, the words on the screen uh, will be everything that you'll need. And we begin by declaring our, our faith together, saying words that Christians believe, not just uh, across the globe, but across history uh, as well. Uh, and we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please take your seats. We continue. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we gather at the Lord's table, we must recall the promises and warnings given to us in the scriptures. Uh, let us therefore examine ourselves and repent of our sins. Uh, let us give thanks to God for his redemption of the world through his Son, Jesus Christ. And as we remember Christ's death for us and receive this pledge of his love, let us resolve to serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. And we say together the words of the confession, words that we say not because we must because we want to remember our need for God. Uh, uh, please read them or just listen to them uh, as we say them together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And now some wonderful promises that the Lord Jesus tells each one of us. Uh, hear the words of comfort our Saviour Jesus Christ says to all who truly turn to him. Uh, come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, hear what the Apostle Paul says. This saying is true and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And hear what the Apostle Paul, uh, John says. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is officiation for our sins. So lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right, it is our duty and our joy, at all times and in all places to give thanks and praise. Holy Father, Heavenly King, Almighty and Eternal God, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And we say this prayer together, recognising that we don't come by right to God, but actually we can come to him by faith in his Son. We pray together. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercy. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord, whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat this bread and to drink this wine, that our sinful bodies be washed through his most precious and our souls are washed through his most precious blood and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. In a moment, I'm going to say, uh, talk about Jesus saying, who made there by his one offering himself 
a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. In other words, when Jesus came, just like Isaac actually, he's the the picture of the full, perfect promise, the one who gave his life for us. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in your tender mercy gave your only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, uh, who made there by his one offering of himself a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world. Uh, He instituted in his holy gospel, commanded us to continue an ongoing memory of his precious death until he comes again. Hear us, merciful Father, we humbly pray, and grant that we, receiving these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may we partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who in the same night he's betrayed, took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Uh, In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Um, The way that we uh, will distribute the bread and the wine is that anyone who knows and loves the Lord Jesus is a a baptised member of their church is welcome to come uh, to take communion. Uh, We've been asked by the bishop about a month ago to to stop uh, dipping, Um, so we'll be uh, receiving the bread and then sharing uh, from the cup. You're very welcome to not take from the cup if you'd like to, uh, but we ask that you don't dip. Um, So if you just want the bread, that is absolutely fine. Uh, But if you do want the wine as well, we'll be uh, drinking uh, from the cup. Uh, We're going to have four stations, two at the front and two at the back. At each station, there'll be one bread and two uh, wine as well, because that takes a bit longer. Um, So if there's a space, just pop along uh, to there, and you'll be directed uh, by a warden uh, to show uh, when to come up and which uh, where to go. But if those who are assisting with communion would like to come forward...
share in the family meal, let us say the words of the Lord's Prayer on the screens for us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. Now to close, let us stand and sing, Great is thy faithfulness. Please do take your seats. Uh, thank you all very much for coming this morning. Thank you for uh, all those who have partake, uh, partook in the service uh, and for John for coming to preach. Uh, we'll have a, a chat with John in about 10 minutes' time. So if you want to grab a drink and then come back and we'll gather at the front uh, here of, of church uh, to ask your, your questions away. Uh, so grab a drink and then come back. Uh, and don't forget about our prayer meeting uh, next week. But to close, uh, a final prayer uh, from the words uh, at the end of the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.